The Civil War was the bloodiest war in American history. Of the nearly 3 million men who fought on both sides, over 620,000 soldiers died in battle or of disease during the war, more than all other wars in American history combined. Hundreds of thousands of men were also wounded during the war, with handicapped veterans commonplace in America after the war. While casualties were high on both sides, the South suffered more than the North. About 20% of white male Southerners died in the war, which in turn left many children as orphans and many women as widows, often without the possibility of remarriage. As historian Drew Gilpin Faust argues in her book, The Republic of Suffering, Americans who lived during the Civil War spent the remainder of their lives dealing with grief and loss. The work of mourning, including public displays of bereavement and care for graves, fell disproportionately on women, making closure even more difficult. The bodies of many men who died were never recovered in order to be shipped home for proper burial. Besides the loss of human life, the war caused over $5 billion of property damage, including the destruction of farms, homes, factories, and railroads. The end of the war also meant the end of slavery. This was an occasion of great rejoicing for slaves and a tremendous expansion of liberty for the nation. But the end of slavery also marked the end of an entire society, the antebellum South. In the aftermath of the Civil War, in the period from 1865 until 1877 known as Reconstruction, congressional Republicans made a concerted effort to ensure equality before the law and voting rights for African Americans, especially with the ratification of the 13th and 14th Amendments, as well as the military occupation of the South to enforce this new order. However, strong resistance on the part of many white Southerners to African American equality, particularly on the part of the Democratic Party, and violent terroristic groups such as the Ku Klux Klan led to the Democrats retaking control of all state governments in the South from the Republicans by 1877. By 1877, many Northerners were tired of dealing with the South and were willing to accept the end of Reconstruction. Unfortunately, in the decades following Reconstruction, White Democratic governments in the South made African Americans second-class citizens, including stripping them of voting rights and passing Jim Crow laws that maintained strict racial segregation in all aspects of social, governmental, and economic life. Although the United States Supreme Court upheld segregation as constitutional in the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson case, provided that facilities were separate but equal, the reality was that separate was never equal. In many ways, white supremacists in the South lost the Civil War but won the peace in the decades that followed as segregation meant that white supremacy still reigned supreme, even as slavery was over. In order to cope with the loss and trauma of the Civil War, as well as to justify the Jim Crow system, an important interpretation of the Civil War known as the Lost Cause Narrative also emerged after the war. The Lost Cause Narrative minimized the immorality of slavery and glorified the antebellum South as having a noble society and way of life. Furthermore, the lost cause narrative downplays the role of slavery in having caused the war, arguing that issues such as tariffs, states' rights, and cultural differences between the North and South were the real causes of the war. The lost cause narrative portrayed the Confederate cause as a noble one. Finally, it asserted that the Reconstruction period that followed the war was a fiasco, as it was marred by Northern corruption and abuses of the South, as well as mismanagement of state governments the latter of which was supposedly just justified segregation, including the exclusion of African American from politics. As historian David Blight argues in his book Race and Reunion, in the decades that followed the Civil War, the lost cause narrative focused on the bravery of soldiers on both sides and minimization of the issue of slavery helped promote national unity and justify racism both in the North and the South. The term lost cause originally came from the title of Virginian Edward A. Pollock's 1866 book about the Civil War entitled The Lost Cause, A New Southern History of the War of the Confederates. While this book was published just after the war itself, Confederate politicians such as President Jefferson Davis and General Jubal Early published memoirs during the 1870s that defended their role in the war and likewise pushed the ideology of the lost cause. In the discipline of history, a prominent historian at Columbia University named William Archibald Dunning became a major proponent of the Lost Cause narrative in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Columbia University had a very large and influential PhD program in history at this time, and Dunning taught an entire generation of graduate students who then became professors at other universities. Dunning wrote a number of influential articles in journals such as the American Historical Review and served terms as both the president of the American Historical Association and American Political Science Association. Dunning's advocacy of the lost cause was so influential that in academic history it has often been called the Dunning School. 
Despite criticism of the Lost Cause narrative as racist mythology from prominent African-American intellectuals such as W.E. Du Bois, the Dunning School dominated the historiography of the Civil War and Reconstruction from the late 19th century until historians such as C. Van Woodward began to discredit it during the 1950s. Besides the discipline of history, the Lost Cause narrative had a tremendous impact on the way the Civil War was memorialized and remembered. Many southern states celebrated Confederate holidays such as the birthday of Robert E. Lee and came to include the Confederate battle flags on their state flags. In popular culture, blockbuster movies such as The Birth of a Nation in the 1920s and Gone with the Wind in the 1930s celebrated the Confederacy, promoted the Lost Cause narrative. In the aftermath of the Civil War, and especially during the early decades of Jim Crow, numerous monuments were also erected to Confederate soldiers that effectively taught the Lost Cause narrative in stump. On a local level, a women's organization known as the United Daughters of the Confederacy was very influential throughout the South in raising funds to build monuments to Confederate soldiers in cemeteries and in public places such as courthouse squares. The largest monument to the Confederacy was the massive 400-foot carving of Confederate leaders Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson riding their favorite horses that was carved on the side of Stone Mountain, Georgia during the 1920s, with latter additions in the 1950s. The Stone Mountain Monument was largely the idea of Helen Plain, an important figure in the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The second clan, the clan of the 1920s, was also refounded at Stone Mountain in 1915, and the clan used Stone Mountain as the site of ceremonies and cross burnings for years thereafter. Overall, most public monuments of the Confederacy were erected during the 1920s and 1950s. While these were decades in which the last surviving Confederate veterans were dying off, more importantly, they were decades of increased racial tensions, Ku Klux Klan activity, and in the case of the 1950s, increasing success on the part of the Civil Rights Movement. In recent years, after a racist gunman opened fire on a Bible study at a predominantly African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina in June 2015, killing nine parishioners, public debate has ensued over the use of Confederate symbols and monuments in public places, with some localities choosing to remove them because of their racist connotations. In August 2017, a rally of neo-Nazis and neo-Confederates and other white nationalists called Unite the Right marched in Charlottesville, Virginia to protest the city's decision to remove a statue of Robert E. Lee from a downtown park. Debate over Confederate statues is still ongoing and intense, which illustrates the long shadow that the Civil War and the Lost Cause narrative has cast and how history really matters. I'll stop with this observation. Thanks for watching.